Okay, I've been following uh, several channels that uh, cover Grand Solar Minimum. I'm 58. When I went to school back in the 70s, they talked about this. They said that uh, in our lifetime, we were going to experience some persistent extreme cold. And uh, so went back and I did some research recently because you can see we're starting to break 100-year records regularly. And uh, I expect the next few years we'll be breaking 200-year and 300-year records. So this whole global warming thing, I think, for whatever reason, is trying to throw everybody off. And we, uh, the data is pretty compelling that, you know, the sun is the primary driver of our temperature of our planet, but yet none of these studies seem to consider it until recently now that we've uh, had a change in admin and uh, we're less political and actually trying to get back science-based. So I put a couple things up here at the top. We have, uh, um, this is done by ADAPT 2030. He did a pretty good presentation. Mine's gonna mirror with some additional information. But then uh, Dr. Valentina Zarkova, she actually has a, a much longer presentation that talks about her methodologies of uh, how she's come to this conclusion that we're gonna be going into a modern minimum type uh, uh, cooling, which is gonna have significant ramifications to our food supply. So anyways, let's get started and uh, so I thought this was kind of acute. I thought about this when I started putting the presentation together that uh, uh, Jay was like, we don't have time for this cover up bull crap. I don't know whether or not you forgot, but there's an Archelian battle cruiser that's about to case us. Hey, hold on, there's an Archelian battle cruiser or a Karelian death ray or an intergalactic plague. It's about to wipe us all of our life on this miserable planet. And the only way these people can get on with their happy lives is they do not know about it. So maybe that's what our government thinks by not really being open with us. It's just to let people enjoy their life and not worry about it. So I'm going to cover the, uh, the normal 11 year solar cycle variation that we see. Most people just think it's the same temperature all the time, but it's not the case. Our planet's temperature, tr historical trends, a definition of a solar minimum and a grand solar minimum. Our sun's output is cyclical, scientists documented uh, dramatic cyclical heating and cooling patterns beyond the 11 year solar cycle. Lack of sunspots appears to be a barometer of the grand solar minimum, as well as a good indicator amount of cooling to expect. Variation between solar minimum cycles could be a normal solar cycle, but it appears um, gas giants, when they all align on one side of the sun, that appears to be a significant contributor. And then I'm going to give you a summary of recommended preparations, but I'm going to do another presentation that gives a comprehensive guide on how to mitigate persistent cold effects and uh, cold effects and food shortages. So here's the uh, output of the sun, historically has shown, you know, a, a regular periodic uh, variation. And you can see that this is just like a sine wave. This is exactly the way your power looks like coming into your house. It's like a 60 hertz cycle. Well, this happens to be a cycle of 11 years between these uh, peaks and troughs. <clears throat> and during this time period, they actually were trying to show that there's differences between you know, the solar flare, irradiance, and sunspot. So there's some variation that started breaking out. It actually looks like in this time period, things started changing. I couldn't find it all the way up to present, but this was something that was uh, on Wikipedia, and I thought it was a, a good, good demonstration of the, the normal 11-year cycle. This, by the way, is the... Uh, on this side is watts per meter squared. This is actually information that's useful if you have solar panels. It tells you how much um, energy the sun is putting out that you can actually collect with your solar panels, but it also directly related to how much heating effect we're going to have on the earth. All right, this was, this was a very interesting chart. This goes back a total of 5,000 years. So we have uh, uh, 2040 AD, it's predicting what it's going to look like, but going back to 2500 BC. 
So you can see back here in this range, we had, you know, some warming and then we went to cooling. And then we went to warming and then we went to cooling, warming, cooling, warming, cooling. You can see there's a cycle, but <clears throat> if this was the stock, stock market, you'd say that there's uh, lower lows that are occurring and not necessarily higher highs. So um, this would indicate, you know, that if something was to happen here where we went from a high to a low, that we could conceivably see something even lower than what we had previously, which was called a little ice age. Now, we're currently over here on the far right, and I thought it was interesting, whoever put this together, they, they show this magic line just all of a sudden going back up again. So what's that all about? Is that uh, just wishful thinking? There's nothing on this chart that shows anything like that that's occurred before. So uh, uh, I think this is probably bogus and maybe somebody saw this chart and said, nope, you can't show that data, you have to change this. But anyways, I thought that was very interesting. And by the way, this, this chart is just full of information. A lot of these uh, cold periods, this is actually showing you know all of the volcanic eruptions that occur during the cold periods. and. Uh, significantly contributed to it. In fact, they're showing up here in this range. We had a significant drop in global temperatures when Mount Pinatubo, Pinatubo in 1991 uh, erupted. You can see it, it dropped it back to the, uh, uh, basically the zero line, but then you know, it recovered you know, after the ash all disappeared. But uh, anyways, it's kind of, a, kind of an interesting chart, so keep this in mind. Okay, so here's some definitions. A solar minimum is the low activity trial of the 11 year solar cycle. It's the Schwab cycle. A grand solar minimum is a period of several successive very low Schwab cycles, usually coinciding with phases of climate disruption and long run cooling. An example is, well known example is the Maunder minimum from 1645 to 1715 that coincided with coldest phase of the Little Ice Age. Little Ice Age from what we've been emerging since 1850 was the coldest period of at least the 8,000 years, possibly the entire Holocene. Grand solar minimum recur in clusters roughly every 200 to 400 years. Probably haven't heard that in school in decades. 27 grand minima have been identified during the Holocene. Um, and here's a paper listed 2007. Thus we were in grand solar minimum about one sixth of the total time. This is a uh, link to this information. I tried to reference everything that I could find here. So scientists identified a high correlation between sunspots and Earth's temperature for the last several thousand years. A larger amount of sunspots correlate to a warmer temperatures of the Earth, and conversely, the sunspots correlate, or less sunspots correlate to cooler temperatures. Basically, when you have sunspots, the, the sun is much more active and uh, emitting a lot more energy. Scientists also use sunspots as a guide as where we are in the solar cycle. As we showed before, the, the Schwab cycle, you know, if, if you see lower s amount of sunspots, you would indicate that you're at the, heading towards the solar minimum. And uh, the more sunspots you see, you're heading towards the solar maximum. As previously stated, solar activity is dominated by 11 year Schwab cycle on an interannual time scale. Recent level of solar activity after the 40s was very high, corresponding to grand solar maximum, which are typical but rare events of solar behavior. However, this grand maximum ceased after so solar cycle 23. So let's look at that. All right, so this is a chart of sunspot activity going all the way back to 1600. And you can see back here, you know, we had a, a peak and then it just collapsed and then we had nothing. So this is what they're talking about. We had, you know, no solar maximums. It was just completely erased to, to just the sun went to sleep during this period and then you see it woke back up so this was the maunder minimum that uh, you know you'll see reference throughout this thing it woke back up and there was some regular frequency but you notice you know there are some much higher than others and, uh, and then all of a sudden we had a low period and then uh, another low period and then this is what they were talking about back in the 40s to 50 that we had a, a solar grand solar maximum that occurred and then now we're falling back down. So let me put some information in here. So here's the grand solar maximum. There's, I talked about that already. There's the Dalton minimum. Um, 
This one wasn't named, but I kind of drew a dotted line in here because based on what I've seen, there, it has to, must be a threshold for which they would call a minimum, but this was definitely indicate that there was probably some significant cooling at that time. And this is being called the eddy minimum uh, if, if we actually do go into this level, which it looks like we will. Now, I thought it was interesting because, you know, I put this line in here. I went back and I found some historical cold records that were broken at this time. So there's definitely something that occurred here right at 1899. And when you look at this information, I mean, Florida saw minus 2 degrees on February 13th in Tallahassee in 1899. I mean, that is unbelievably cold. I lived in St. Petersburg, Florida, and, you know, it was rare down there that we ever even saw a freeze. But minus 2 degrees, that's terrible. You can see Louisiana was minus 16. Um, we have uh, D.C. was minus 15. Ohio got to minus 39 degrees. Um, so anyways, uh, this, this gives you a rough idea, you know, of uh, what could happen. And all of this is referenced down here where this came from. But uh, this is showing a lot of variability of our sun over this time period. Um, a lot of the charts you'll see, you know, they're only trying to show you the last 10 years or something to try to you know, make you think that there are 40 years even that uh, things have really, you know, gotten out of control, but that's not the case. All right, so this is a shorter time period looking at uh, the data, so we're, we're going to kind of keep zooming in so we can see what this looks like. And uh, so this actually starts putting in uh, projection for number 25. and. You know, we're currently at the bottom of 24, and they're saying, you know, what is 25 going to look like? So here you go. Present day, 25 is going to be this itty-bitty little blip. And it's very similar to, and we're really not going to know for another three or four years if this is really going to come out this way. But right now, based on the modeling, they're saying this is what's going to happen. And so if you notice, this is very similar to that pre previous chart where the uh, modern minimum where it just fell off a cliff and just did not come back. And the question is, how long is it going to be and how, how cold is it going to be? Now, here's another chart. This is uh, from Dr. David Hathaway. And, you know, he's been plotting this very carefully and using their modeling. And I, I thought this was kind of interesting. So same thing. We're looking at the last three cycles, and you can see the significant drop-off that's occurring. But one other thing that's curious is, according to the model right here, you'll notice that we're even falling off the bottom of the model. So we're not, we're not uh, straddling it. As you can see, the rest of these are kind of going you know, right across the line. We're actually falling off the bottom of the line. So that, uh, that's curious uh, in itself. Now, I, I tried to find uh, the raw data for the satellite data, but it just does not look like it's available, at least in a format that I can read. But I found something that somebody had, uh, uh, you know, summarized since, I guess we've only had satellites up there since 79 measuring this, but uh, 1979. But you can see that uh, they have this raw data, and it's, it's actually falling off rapidly from... Uh, it looks like 2016, the temperature of the whole world. Now, this red line is a moving 13-month average, so it's going to take a long time for that to, you know, catch up to the trend. But because the temperature has been dropping off rapidly, it actually is moving significantly as it is. But I did put a line in here because I thought this you should see uh, this is data that's not, you know, some of the temperature measuring stations we have on earth are next to you know hot asphalt pavement and stuff but this is measuring from a satellite and it's averaging the whole earth and when you look at this now you can see that we are now uh, at around uh, 2001 2 time period and and it uh, it's, it's dropping rapidly. So I'm kind of curious, you know, in the next year's worth of data, whether this is now going to bring us back down to zero, and then another year if we're going to start being negative and how that works. But um, this is kind of curious that the media doesn't really talk about this. They're ignoring, again, the obvious orange glowing object in the sky. 
All right, so I'm throwing the same chart back up here because I wanted to give you some information. There have been six documented solar minimums. So this is where that previous chart was talking about, you know, the period of time in, we see these things. So you can see this was 1,040, and then we're 1,150, then 1,270, 1,430, 1,620, 1,787, and then 2020. And then I listed the the period of time that they had them listed. So 40, 50, 80, 90, 90, 56, we don't know. What is this gonna be? Is it gonna be 40 years? Is it gonna be 90 years? Is it gonna be longer than that? I don't know, but 40 years is going to be a long time in anybody's lifetime, you know. 90 years is approaching, you know, two generations anyway. So um, we'll, we'll have to see how this is gonna work out. Now this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, this is one working theory is that we have these extremely large planets, gas giants specifically, that are all lined up on this side of the sun. And uh, I don't know if this is because of a electrical magnetism or is it a gravity, what it is, but something is uh, potentially working on the sun and uh, causing this um, change in this in the sun's output but uh, we have mathematical models that you know show when this has occurred in the past and uh, back in 1665 around the modern minimum we had the same thing in this case um, the next cycle here starts in the winter of 2019 and uh, I guess goes all the way through 2032 which is going to be you know probably the worst period so let's uh, let's do a quick summary we appear to be heading towards a modern minimum type cooling the Earth's weather is exiting a relatively warm period and unfortunately entering a time of persistent cold and will have a major impact to our agricultural zones it's one thing I think about when it's cold we have a lot of production up in the you know, Midwest, and uh, if all of a sudden that is knocked offline, uh, where's the food going to come from? Um, so the food is likely going to be, have to be produced between the 40 degree latitudes north and south of the equator. Major consequences are theorized dramatic temperature changes, in this case persistent cold temperatures, floods, drought, crop failures, solar coronal mass ejections, um, it's basically like a nuclear bomb going off and it could blow up all of our electronics, all our power, everything. Increased volcanic activities, we're already seeing that kind of uh, poking up right now. Earthquakes and wars. So I thought this would be, this was a good chart I found um, and it kind of put all the different types of uh, environmental things that happen in the contiguous USA. So we have earthquakes, moderate and high floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes. Um, I went ahead and... Sorry about that. Should have turned my phone off. So here's a line, um, the Mason-Dixon line that's approximately in this area here. So this will be something that could be, um, you know, basically your survivability area for where we can grow food, maybe where you should live. You know, anything up here could be very cold. The other line is the uh, 40 degree latitude is approximately around in this area. So it's questionable to know exactly where this needs to be, but you know, you probably need to consider being south of one of these two lines. This, the, uh, the green line is probably the preferable one, but then you gotta keep in mind, you know, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, all that kind of stuff. All right. So this is a graphical view that uh, David Dubine from uh, ADAPT 2030 put together. And I found a similar one on Armstrong Economics, but they basically uh, plotted these uh, color bars running vertically are where we had uh, civilization collapses. Um, and they coincided pretty close to, if not exactly, the previous uh, minimums that we have documented. 
All right. So civiliz civilizations tend to collapse, and I suspect it was probably due to food scarcity. Governments around the world will try to control the coming collapse, I believe. It's one of the reasons why we're supporting fracking, even though there's uh, really no business case. Additionally, they recently opened up coal again, which the USA is said to have hundreds of years reserves. We will need this energy, energy to mitigate what's coming. This can be a major impact to the world for decades to come. It could be 40 to 90 year period if, or longer. If history repeats, there will be years with no summer. Can you imagine um, you actually get a couple feet of snow and then it never melts? You get another couple feet of snow and it never melts and it keeps, uh, keeps snowing. Uh, that's what can happen. And then, you know, where are you going to put all of this? North and Mason Dixon line will be significantly impacted. Fall crops will not survive, like what occurred in 2017, where 30% of the wheat crop was destroyed due to early frost. Citizens in large cities don't have food producing capability, so what are they going to do? The link below documents the modern minimum 400 years ago. This video is tainted by some global warming garbage, but otherwise pretty good documentary of the conditions human had to, humans had to endure. All right, so food and energy, both will become intermittent and expensive. Prices will be managed. I expect the governments will price fix to reduce the appearance of gouging. People will be forced to set up home gardens like Victory Gardens, World War II, raise chickens, rabbits, etc. I don't know how you're going to do that in the city. I lived in Florida and we had a postage stamp yard. There just really wasn't that much room. Uh, people need to immediately improve their homes by adding insulation and supplemental heating wood, coal stoves, gas fireplaces, etc. Housing. People that have financial resources will relocate to the south of the Mason-Dixon line. Multiple generations will likely need to cohabitate like in the past, uh, need to have a couple acres which can be farmed and grow animals to survive. And the main reason for cohabitating is to share resources, any income that they might have, any savings, that kind of thing, because this is going to be such a long duration, it's going to take uh, multiple families, you know, grouping together to accomplish this. Those that don't have adequate financial resources are likely to perish. A cold climate is tough to endure. Expect 15 to 20 percent of population loss worldwide, best case. Um, another thing that can happen is plagues uh, will likely propagate rapidly. Think about the Black Plague and other things like that. Uh, it's very possible. Power and water utilities, power lines will go down because of the massive storms. Water pipes will be bursting, public sewer systems failing. If power is lost for months or more, then we will lose more than half the population since people in cities are unable to be self-sufficient. And you think about like nursing homes, hospitals, things like that, they're only going to have generators that will last for a certain amount of time. Uh, potential for mass die-off. If a mass die-off occurs, our advanced society will struggle to maintain electric, telecoms, food production, distribution, sanitation, medicine, etc. Already during the 2017-2018 winter last year, temperature records were broken dating back 100 years ago. In North Georgia, we typically average one inch of snow each winter, yet we received seven inches. In 2018-19, Fall, some areas received as much snow in a couple days what is typical for a year. That was a storm that just went through, I think it was in the Carolinas. In a couple years, we'll be breaking 200 and 300 year old records, and by then it'll be too late to prepare. Professor Valentina Zarkova's research indicates that from 2019 to 2027, we will have reduced food output, but from 2028 to 2032, there will be likely zero food output. I can only assume then food will come back online after this period, but very slowly over the next 50 to 70 years. Now think about this. In the USA, most homes, apartments, and businesses no longer have supplemental heating in the event of a long duration power outage. In North Georgia, where I live, two-stage heat pumps uh, cut off, cut out at about 15 to 20 degrees, and then the HVAC runs on heat strips, which is huge electric bills and straining utilities. Most other areas, like Florida, only use single-stage heat pumps and they cut out around basically freezing. Many homes in North Georgia have supplemental wood or gas fireplaces, but some do not. I believe we need to prepare by becoming as self-sufficient as possible by developing our own food sources and mitigating the effects of persistent cold. Our antiquated electrical system will likely not meet the demand. It takes years to bring new power plants online. It seems unlikely this will happen without tremendous effort. Transportation will also 
be dramatically affected due to impassable roads, river ice dams, flooding of roads, um, businesses. Imagine years where the snow never melts and piles up year after year. I mentioned that earlier. The following is a summary of things you need to consider to survive this coming persistent cold weather. I'll provide a step-by-step -step details on how I'm preparing for this in future presentations. So we've always heard of you know food, water, shelter, that kind of things, but Lynette Zhang has expanded on this and thrown a couple other things in. So I started trying to fill this out, to thinking about you know some of the things that I'm doing and should be doing. So let's start with uh, food. So first thing you need to do is try to grow your own meat, and so you can get cold hardy chickens, and I'll tell you in a future presentation what what kind those are. You need to get you know. So you can have eggs and, and meat as well, and uh, also rabbits. Rabbits are very cold hardy, so they're they're great to grow. I'm I'm doing that right now. Both of these things. In your garden, you can do uh, Hugo culture beds, and you can Google that to see what that is, and uh, put edible perennials in there. Also, focus primarily on cold weather crops. Uh, get a greenhouse or a high tunnel or both. Substantial stored dried raw foods. Um, legumes, fruits, powdered milk, butter, bread ingredients, meats, etc. For water, you know, most of us are on city water, but maybe you ought to try to get a well and a rain catchment. Um, I've currently got about six thousand dollar uh, gallons that I'm catching uh, rain off of, and uh, um, you can use that for your garden, but you can also filter it and drink it. Um, get away from the big cities and get below the Mason Dixon line. Um, why do I say get away from the big cities? Well, the problem with big cities is you're completely dependent on the electrical, you're dependent on the uh, sewer systems, uh, everything. The food, which, you know, you don't really have your own food. It's not a farming area. Um, so I recommend you get in the country, you know, get, if you're going to live in a residential area, make sure there's no HOA, make sure you get a couple acres and uh, a newer home with uh, two by six construction because it has better insulation. You know, the double pane windows, good R, R value in the attic. Um, in myself, I actually super insulated my attic last year. Um, I noticed my wood stoves just weren't cutting it because it was all just escaping right out the house. So I put an R80 and I even put a radiant barrier laying across the horizontal uh, attic floor. And that actually has done a wonderful thing, locking the heat into the house. Um, I put uh, in my walkout basement, I also stuck a wood stove in there. I haven't even had to use that yet, but uh, it's there for backup. And uh, the nice thing about if you get a house with a basement, it's a constant temperature control. A lot of these houses up here in North Georgia, if you buy a 2,500 foot, square foot house, you can get a 2,500 square foot uh, basement and it's a walkout so you have three sides surrounded by earth and the four side is open to the outside uh, well I mean not open but there's a door that goes out but you can store all your food in there and it's a worst case condition sheltered area so energy you know you've got the grid but you need the backup for the grid so solar or propane generator wood you know um, so like I said I've got wood stove in the basement but I'm also storing my own energy I got a wood stove upstairs as well, but I've got you know six cord split in season, and I got five cord in rounds that are ready to split. Um, I got grid tied solar with inverter, and this specific inverters have uh, a secure power supply. So I've got for each inverter two kilowatts each, and when the grid is down and the sun is shining, I can actually plug my refrigerator or freezers in there and uh, you know cool the things down, you know as long as the sun is out. And I also have a 15 kilowatt bi-fuel generator. So again, you want flexibility. So I've got propane, 200 gallon tank, and I also can run it off of gasoline. So I can siphon out of my vehicles, out of my boat, whatever, and, and keep the thing going if I needed to. And I also have a 220 gallon propane tied to an on-demand water heater that, uh, that also to a gas cooktop in the oven in the basement. Um, next, you need to consider security. So you need to fortify your property. Large dogs are great, but uh, I'm not going to give away uh, too many of my secrets how we do it, but I can tell you generically some of the things that you, you can do here. 
you know, bartering is, uh, you know, get some liquor, get some cigarettes, get some silver, uh, gold, etc., that kind of thing. You're going to need it. But primarily for wealth preservation, I recommend gold is for that, silver, and other tangible assets. You got food producing land, you know, single family homes, things like that. Uh, people are still going to have to have places to live. And the community is uh, coordinate with uh, like minded people. So that's the end of this presentation. My next presentation will provide you with step by step details on how to prepare for the Grand Solar Minimum. So that's it for now. I'm going to go ahead and stop this. That was 32 minutes. I was trying to get it done sooner. God bless and uh, look, look uh, in the future for uh, some good information I'm going to provide on uh, step by step on how to prepare for this thing the, the best we can. God bless.